For most of the past decade, sodium ion batteries sat in the exact same bucket as graphene and also solid state chemistry. Interesting on paper, endlessly discussed, especially in the media, especially on the headlines, but never quite real. <laughs> For very, you know, for a few reasons, various reasons really, and this will all make sense by the second half of the video. So they're always a year away, or next year, or five years away, or something like that, or a few months, or something like that, or something's just on the road on a on a trial run. And for a long time, that reputation was actually deserved. Actually, early sodium battery cells were very, very low energy density, bulky and heavy. There were some issues, especially with the voltage range, awkward to manufacture frankly not competitive at all with lithium ion phosphate and I think everyone kind of knew that there was not enough energy density in them so that really just prevented people investing a lot of money in them. A couple of years ago, literally just a few years ago, CATL decided to put some money into that. Very, very little effort and they've just superseded uh, what we have in BUIDs nowadays in, you know, 165 watt hours per kilogram in an ATO 3 or something like that. And you can get now the Naxtra uh, battery, which is 175 to 180 watt hours per kilogram. So I think we can see that go over 200 in the next two or three years, I should imagine. But something changed over the past year and a half. So it didn't happen with a press release or a launch event. It actually happened very, very quietly inside some factories, procurement contracts and battery supply agreements. Sodium ion batteries stopped being treated like an experiment essentially and started being used as a cost tool. There has been some mysterious work being built underneath uh, electric vehicles for the last couple of years. We should probably also mention the Belt Road Initiative and China's digital currency but that really needs its own uh, video so I'll mention those in a separate video in the next uh, few, few weeks. The biggest problem really facing EVs right now isn't range or charging speed or even performance. It's price volatility, it's uncertainty, and it's the fact that the cost base of an electric car can swing so wildly depending on what happens to lithium prices or geopolitics or something like that, or something that you know Trump says or Musk or something, or uh, supply chains basically just half a world away. By the end of 2025, sodium ion batteries have effectively become a way to stabilize that chaos. That was one of the, the really big incentives for developing the chemistry. I believe the key development is that sodium ion has now crossed from pilot production into early mass manufacturing using largely the same production lines as LFP. It's very easy to convert LFP chemistry battery uh, manu you know, manufacturing lines to produce sodium ion chemistry uh, batteries. That's a very big deal. It means manufacturers no longer have to build bespoke factories and train entirely new workforces or even redesign their entire supply chains. Sodium cells can be coated, assembled, packaged using equipment already uh, amortized for lithium iron phosphate batteries. That alone removes one of the biggest historical barriers uh, for decades, basically. At the same time, the chemistry itself has matured a lot. Energy density is uh, still lower than the, you know, the very best LFP chemistry, but it's no longer disastrous. So we're now talking roughly 160, 170 watt hours per kilogram at the cell level in general uh, sodium cells these days uh, that are in production currently, compared with around 160, 180 for mainstream LFP chemistry. But you can also get Gen 2 blade batteries, which are 200 and something and you can also get um, there's CATL have some batteries too which are really really great so we, we can definitely get over 200 watt hours per kilogram now with LFP chemistry what really changed the equation though is actually cold weather performance because by late 2025 the end of last year sodium ion cells are consistently delivering consistently uh, 90 percent or more percent uh, usable capacity at minus 20 degrees celsius which is pretty cold i mean that's maybe a summer's day in canada but it is pretty cold for the rest of us and still around 80 percent at minus 30 degrees celsius which again is i mean what's that that's probably spring or something isn't it in canada so crucially they can accept charge at those temperatures without aggressively having to preheat the battery inside. It's a lot of thermal mass, like a lot of mass there to, to have to heat up and to, so, to, so that it will you know, work and charge up. That solves a real practical problem and an issue really for cold regions where LFP struggles and where range loss in winter has been a genuine consumer pain point. I mean, anyone who's driven a, a, a car with LFP chemistry in, in very, very cold temperatures, I, I have obviously, and I've seen the range drop to, I don't know, 65% rather than, you know, 98, 99, where it was before. And then it gets really, really cold. You leave it out overnight, 65, 70%. That's all you got. So 
I've seen that. I mean, it's pretty bad. And it's okay with the Tesla because you've got it's a good car. They've got good chemistry, uh, and they've got a big big battery. You can afford to lose a hundred kilometers of range. You can afford to do that because on almost every day of the year, no one ever needs it, so it's fine until you do need it. So sodium ion cells are now coming in roughly 10 or 15% cheaper, at least as a minimum, than LFP cells uh, at the cell level. Naxtra, I think they can get that, it, uh, CATL with the Naxtra battery, they say they can get it way lower than that. So yeah, this is a much more believable and sustainable uh, chemistry than I think people realised. And because sodium doesn't rely on lithium carbonate or even hydroxide, the, the cost advantage is far more stable over time. Car makers are not just looking to uh, looking at today's price, they're actually looking at whether they can lock in battery costs for five or ten years without nasty surprises or with very little uh, movement on the price. That is why sodium is increasingly being used as a hedge, actually, I think. Lithium prices have proven brutally volatile over the past few years, although it's a very good chemistry and it's good to use it. Uh, spikes and crashes and policy shocks, export restrictions. For an industry trying to plan model cycles years in advance, that they will be for sure doing this, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years ahead. That's a nightmare. So sodium doesn't eliminate lithium. It actually just reduces exposure and uh, hates, helps create a sort of base, I suppose, and it lowers the amount of lithium needed per vehicle on average for, say, a continent or a country or per market. It smooths out the risk, and uh, in procurement terms, that's gold. You know, if you speak to anyone in, in the industry, that is a really important thing. By the end of 2025, we're also seeing a clear shift in how sodium is being deployed. It's not replacing lithium across the board. Instead, it's actually being paired with LFP in mixed chemistry battery packs or hybrid battery packs. Sodium cells are used for cold starts, low state of charge operation and frequent shallow cycling. LFP handles high speed cruising, uh, peak power demands, things like that, and energy density. And uh, yeah, the result is a pack that degrades much more slowly in uh, real world urban use and performs better in winter, significantly well better in winter actually, and costs less to warranty over time. So it's, it's pretty genius really. They never cease to amaze me, these companies like BYD and CATL, particularly CATL, there are just so many steps ahead of, the, of all of us, uh, what our understanding is. So uh, yeah, we, I'd love to know what they've got on their computers, honestly. That last point is a really important thing, it's critical really. Warranty risk is one of the, the silent killers of cheap EVs and uh, never gets talked about. I don't think I ever really have heard, heard, heard some talk about it. Sodium ion battery cells are increasingly, uh, sorry, inherently more stable with no oxygen release during thermal runaway and lower fire propagation risk. Insurers and fleet buyers are paying attention, not because sodium is exciting, but because it's predictable and, and of course much more safe. And that brings us to the real reason sodium, sodium ion matters. It doesn't make EVs better necessarily, it makes them viable and that's what makes them, them better. So for years, the industry chased flagship specs, bigger batteries, longer range, faster charging, more power, but the mass market doesn't actually need that. Most people drive short distances, park outdoors, maybe even park on indoors or park on ferries. If you're a Norwegian, you will find yourself on a ferry quite often a lot of the time actually in Norway to go over the little bits of water. Uh, if you live in a cold climate or a hot climate and care more about upfront price and long-term reliability than uh, lap times or range records, this makes a big difference to you. So sodium iron fits that reality. It's brilliant, it's like an accidental hole in the market and we, and we accidentally created it, sodium fills it. So by late 2025, it became very, very clear that sodium ion batteries are helping set a new price floor for EVs. They define how cheap a functional reliable electric car can realistically be built without uh, relying on subsidies or heroic assumptions about raw material prices. On a 30 to 40 kilowatt hour city EV, the savings might only be maybe a few hundred dollars per vehicle but the manufacturers operating on uh, razor thin margin, that is a huge difference. And that's the difference between launching a car and canceling it effectively. And also whether uh, there can actually be a product created ready to ship in the first place. Having access to affordable batteries is now becoming much, much harder for most EV brands 
38% of EV battery market last year was actually supported and uh, by CATL batteries. And the next biggest player after that was BYD with 16.8% of the EV battery market. All other brands, basically like LG or Sony, were in single digits. And the gap is increasing between those two distinct groups. This is exactly why sodium ion is uh, actually showing up in, the, in, in small cars, urban vehicles, delivery fleets, and grid-linked EVs. Not because it's glamorous at all, but because it works and it, it lowers risk. It stabilizes costs, it allows companies to plan. And perhaps most importantly, I should say, it marks a shift in how the EV industry thinks about batteries altogether, because I think the industry sees it differently as to, to how we consumers think about batteries. We can see the market adapting to batteries, which will outlive the car by many, many times, multiple times. So we're moving away from the idea that there's one best battery chemistry. The future isn't lithium versus sodium. It's lithium and sodium used where each makes the most sense. And diversity is what we will have, not dominance, I think. Dominance would be the wrong word to use. So when we say sodium ion batteries have officially become a cost tool, not an experiment at all, it's a description of behavior, I think. Car makers are ordering them, engineers are designing around them, procurement teams are then actually budgeting with them, and none of that happens really unless the technology has crossed a distinct line, a very important line, so to speak. So sodium ion isn't the future of EVs, it's something more subtle than that. It's the thing that makes the rest of the EV transition just significantly less fragile. So I would argue that uh, the it's closer to a binding agent, actually, than the dominating chemistry in the EV world. That might be the most important battery story of this decade, ironically, and, and probably no one's picking up on it. Very, very important. So if you've got thoughts on this, you are you know very welcome to put your thoughts in the comments. If you live somewhere very, very hot or very, very cold, I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts in the comments. I read literally all the comments. And um, one of the next videos will actually be about China and how they're aiming to transform the way in w which they transport vehicles and uh, products globally in such a fantastic way. And you've probably heard about it. It's called the uh, Belt Road uh, in uh, Initiative. And it's a fascinating story. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate your time. My name is Ben Alexander. And uh, these are the channel members. Thank you to these people. Thank you so much for all of your help.